Hello everybody and welcome back to Nerd Rat. I'm Sean and today we're gonna do a new episode of Old Ass Cameras, which I haven't done in a long time. I think it's been like two or three years and obviously things have changed a little bit with the setup. So I'm excited to do another one of these episodes. And today we're gonna be talking about the Cine Kodak 8. Now this is actually kind of a special piece to me because this actually is in my family. This is my great grandmother's. My grandma gave it to me. And so I'm very excited to talk about this because there's a lot of very interesting things about this little camera. So we'll go into the history of this camera a little bit. It was made by the Eastman Kodak Company. Obviously, this is a Kodak camera between 1933 and 1946. So this was kind of right in the smack dab of World War II era, which is kind of fascinating that this thing is one, in such good shape, and two, that it was in my family during that time a lot of history there, you know? This camera was actually specifically made for home video. If you actually look up the, the manual, which I had to do to get some of the specs on this, a lot of it is geared towards shooting your kids and, what well, phrasing, yeah, that was <laughs> bad, bad phrasing there. Filming your kids and the everyday life, like old VHS cameras that like even my dad used to film freaking everything that we did together. One thing that I found pretty interesting in the manual is that on a single roll of film, they say you can make up to 20 to 30 movie scenes. They kind of equate it to like a newsreel like back in the day. I don't know if you see that trope in World War II movies where people are in a theater and they're like, this just in, uh, uh, Japan is bombing whatever. And then it's like, you know, footage from all this, you know, different scenes of the war. And that's kind of what they're likening the movie scenes too. So I, I would imagine the shots aren't all that long, but still kind of cool that you can get a pretty decent amount of footage per roll, which, you know, the, these rolls actually cost about $2 a piece at the time, which isn't bad. I, I didn't convert that. I'll put that up on the screen, the conversion rate for that. Another thing I found pretty interesting was the manual exposure guide on the side here. Again, this was made for the home videographer, someone who wanted to capture their kids or a vacation or something like that. So this actually helps you make sure that you're always in correct exposure because you don't have histograms and false color and all these other things to help you properly expose your film like you do today with digital cameras. It is also just like a little piece of cardboard in there, um, which is kind of, I'm, I feel very lucky that I still have that piece. When I was looking up stuff on this camera, a lot of the times this was missing because it's just a little card slot. I don't really want to mess with it because it looks fragile, <laughs> but I am very happy that, you know, my grandparents took good care of this to have that still intact. This camera was also purpose built to be as small and as compact as possible. Essentially, they wanted you to be able to throw it in a suit pocket and be able to take it anywhere. Now there's no electricity or anything like that either. So you could literally take it anywhere. You don't need to charge it. Uh, it runs off of springs. We'll get into that more in just a second. Now this is assuming that uh, people in the 1940s had pockets big enough for this, but I feel like most suits had big old pockets that you can stick one of these things in. It is kind of heavy. It weighs a few pounds at least. So it might be kind of a weight on you, but still kind of cool that it was made to be like almost essentially like a cell phone camera <laughs> of today. This camera actually came out in two separate models, the Kodak Cine 8 Model 20 and the Model 25. So the 20 came with a 13 millimeter F 3.7 lens. And the Model 25, which is what I have, came with a 13 millimeter 2.7 f-stop lens. So it's a little better in that low light. Both lenses actually went up to f-16. So you had a pretty good range of exposure that would allow you to expose for most instances, even in broad daylight. Luckily, I come from a family full of photographers, so they must have known that having a slightly faster lens would be beneficial in the long run. I actually couldn't find anything on the price difference, um, but I would assume the Model 25 was slightly more for that better lens. So I actually went back and did a little more research in the manual to see if I could actually find the prices. And sure enough, at the very end, they had a price index. So as you can see here, the Model 20 was $29.50 which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you convert that for today's inflation, that would have been around 650 bucks. That means the Model 25 being $42 would have been $927 roughly. So that's actually kind of pricey. That's kind of like today's kind of DSLR prices. The other fun thing I found is that they also have like accessories that you can get for all the cameras in this kind of a manual slash catalog that I found. So you can see here for the carrying cases for the Model 20 or 25 would have been $3.50, which in today's money 
would have been $77. <laughs> but you know, it must've been a pretty nice, probably leather case handmade in Italy or something like that. The other cool thing is that these little tiny lenses also came with filters. They looked like they just slipped over the front. So that allowed you to maybe put NDs on or a polarizer, or even if you're shooting black and white on this, you could put it on different color filters and that would change what like the landscape looked like or skin tones or depending on where you're shooting, you could change the color of the front and that would actually dictate what your black and white luma values would look like. Because you're not actually exposing anything to a saturated chroma film sock, uh, you could do that and it wouldn't look red. It would just add like, it would make the blues look darker in the sky or something like that. So both cameras shot eight millimeter film stock and that could be color or black and white. Now mine still opens. Some of these, uh, it looks like it's been dropped. So there's a little bit of a ding, but it does open. And I do actually have some film inside here still. It looks like it's exposed. So I don't think I can get anything off of it. And I don't honestly want to touch it because I feel like it would fall apart, but it is kind of cool that it kind of still has some of the internals uh, still working. This film stock is considered double perf. So that means that the sprockets on this wheel that runs the film through the camera has two sets of sprockets on either side of the film stock. I couldn't really find out what the benefit of that was, except for maybe a smoother feed and a more sure feed. So you wouldn't accidentally double expose your film, but it is kind of cool that it all still looks to be in great shape on the inside of this. So I think I could probably actually shoot eight millimeter film stock if I actually went to buy some. Now, if you want to see that, go ahead and leave me a comment down below and I will try to find some of that and shoot something on this because that would be kind of cool. So like I was saying earlier, the camera does not have any electronics in it. It's all manual. It's all, I guess, physics or mechanical. That's the word mechanical. So it came with this little winding key on the side and mine actually still works. You can crank on it and it will actually wind up that spring that's in there. And it's essentially a big coil. Like uh, I think watches have a similar mechanism, old watches or old big clocks have a similar thing uh, built inside of it. Now, if you fully crank this all the way up, I, I try not to use it too much because I feel like it might need some maintenance or like some oil or something before I actually use this. But if you were to crank this all the way up, it had a runtime of about one and a half minutes. So you couldn't do like long one takes, but you could shoot, you know, like someone blowing out candles on a birthday cake and you'd be fine. So once it's all wound and you're ready to shoot, this is actually the record button. And it's not just a button, you actually pull it down and ready for this? Mine still works, ready? Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> it, it actually runs and I try not to do it very often, but I found that out and that's pretty cool that the, the mechanisms are still working away in there. As you're shooting too, it has this little window on the side and that it shows you how many feet of film you have left. Mine is currently at just under 25, which is about as long as these film reels were, which is really not that long, but again, it's a very small compact thing. You don't have a lot of room for all that extra film. Now, I never actually found out what the frame rate was on this, but I imagine it's somewhere in 24. I feel like that was pretty standard. It might be less. I honestly don't know. I didn't find that anywhere. <laughs> if you know, let me know down in the comments because I'd be curious, but um, you'd actually be able to figure out how much you're recording based off that frame rate and how many feet you have left. So if you say you had five feet left, you could be like, okay, we have this many minutes left or seconds left of footage. I've never had to deal with that again with SD cards and CF cards or whatever. It will show you how much time you have left. So we're very lucky. We don't have to do mental math. The camera does it for us, but still a very cool little feature. Now going back to the lens, it does have little exposure adjustments that you can do on here. And these actually kind of lock in place. There's a little piece of metal here that kind of locks it in place so you don't accidentally bump it out if you're filming and you lose your exposure. But you can look at this and be like, okay, I'm shooting in bright sun and it'll show you, okay, you want to go to F11 and then you can just tune this little thing and you're at F11, which I actually nailed that without really looking. <laughs> Again, thinking of everything to keep this as compact as possible, this comes with a little handle. Not only can you carry it around and, you know, go for a stroll and, you know, go film some ducks in the, in the local pond. If you look through it this way, it's actually the viewfinder. So there's a little tiny piece of glass on this side and a little bit bigger one on this side that looks to maybe magnify a little bit or maybe correct the distortion or something like that. But you can actually look through this and film. 
I thought that was pretty neat. Mine's super dirty, but I kind of like the age, the patina that's on this thing. But I thought that was a kind of a cool little feature and then it just folds away and it's fine. And you don't need to have like an eyepiece or something off the side like you would with most film cameras. It just kind of gets you in the ballpark of knowing what your composition is. So you're not just like, Ho hopefully I, I got the kid's birth, you know? <laughs> now this camera only has one tripod mounting point right on the bottom here. I don't assume that anybody was doing vertical video back in the day. I don't think that was on anybody's radar. And I don't know how you'd mount on the side here because these walls are very thin, but you can mount it to a tripod. And this is actually the tripod that my great grandparents uh, used. I'm assuming maybe grandparents, maybe they handed down this camera to them. And you can actually go ahead and shoot. And like, how freaking cute is that? That's so cool. And this thing actually pops way out. You can actually go pretty high with this thing. I actually use this little mini camera as my streaming camera setup. So I put my little Logitech on this little thing and it sits on my desk and I look at it every day. I don't really stream anymore, but it is kind of a cool little thing to have. Hopefully one day I'll actually be able to shoot on this. I, I don't know how much film is anymore or where to get it properly, you know, developed. But uh, again, if you guys know where to find this kind of stuff or where to get it developed, please let me know because I will do a follow up video and shoot like a mini short film on this thing, try to do, you know, the whole edited in camera kind of thing on one roll and see what we come up with because I think that would be freaking cool. But I think that's it for this video. There wasn't a whole lot of info on this camera that I could find. If I missed anything, please let me know down in the comments if someone else has this in their collection as well. I'm very curious. I'm always loving to find out new things about my camera collection. So yeah, please let me know. Hopefully you like this video. Uh, be sure to subscribe and we'll see you in the next episode.